Those sticky hands. Oh man, I, I can <laughs> I've been there. I know all about that. Well, hello there, and welcome to the Bible Geeks Weekly Podcast. This is episode 102. I'm Brian Sheely. I'm Ryan Joy. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We're wrapping up our conversation on dedication. We've already covered counting the cost, wholeheartedness, establishing priorities, and today we're going to finish this thing up by talking about being available to others around us. Yeah, and it seems appropriate to think about this as the world is starting to kind of slowly open up. (laughs) How many times over the last year have you wanted to go somewhere just to realize or remember that they weren't open for business? Oh, for sure. (laughs) <laughs> and even places that weren't shut down, the hours were limited and there were all kinds of limitations and stipulations. And so there were so many of our kids' favorite experiences and places where they just got used to for a while hearing, well, they're not open right now. And, I, you know, that kind of applies to us. I wonder how many of us have followed suit in doing that same thing as Christians serving each other over the last year, limiting our hours, so to speak, placing these buffers and barriers to our relationships. Even when we can't see someone in person, we we don't have to engage from an emotional distance. We can reach out and be available. So it seems like a perfect time to talk about being available to others. All right, so let's get into our first segment here, and that is Like the Teacher. And so as we always do, we're going to Jesus here to start out the episode, finding an example of when he was available to others. And one of the first examples that pops to mind is the conversation that he has with his disciples when they try to keep Jesus away from the little children. So in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, we find this account where Jesus is being blocked, in a sense, by his disciples as these parents are apparently trying to bring their children to Jesus and have Jesus touch them. It almost reminds me of like the president when people bring their babies and they want the the president to like kiss their baby. Or I don't know what they do. I, I've, I, I can't even imagine why you'd want to do something like that. But here they want Jesus to touch their little children. And the disciples will have none of this. They're like, no, 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 no. You guys stay over there. You don't bother Jesus. Jesus is too busy for you. I mean, they don't say it in those words, but Jesus finally has to come and say, look, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And he takes them all in his arms and he blesses them and he lays his hands on them. And so Jesus is available to these little children. And reading the story, what do you understand about our availability today? I see Jesus modeling childlike goodness here. (laughs) Kind of ironically, he's exemplifying the lesson when he doesn't get caught up in that typical grown-up attitude of self-importance and and haste. I've got so much to do. I've I've got important things to do. I can't be down there dealing with that stuff. Unlike the kind of self-importance that most of us can create about ourselves, Jesus was actually important. He had <laughs> actual important things to do. Yes. And he was, I mean, he was important with a capital I, and he still is. He created us all. And yet he wasn't too big to let a four-year-old tug on his beard in the middle of a (laughs) busy day of ministry or whatever happened there. And so I just think that's such a beautiful lesson about him not being too grown up to be with children in this way, to see bigger priorities. And we may we all remember we're not that important and our deadlines that press on us. And if we could step outside that little world of anxiety and see our time and our lives from a divine perspective, we'll see the value of of the people that we're around and of the small tasks in a different way. And so to be like a child is to be like Jesus, Mm -hmm. the God man who carried responsibility for the whole world on his shoulders. It's a bit of a paradox. Yeah. Here is the most responsible person, and yet he acts like a child, at least in this way. Yeah. We see something about Jesus' character here, obviously, and I think that's the most value we can get out of this. But from from my perspective, thinking about this story, I'm looking at the disciples, and I'm just like scratching my head. What are you defending Jesus from? 
Exactly. <laughs> what are they so afraid of? Those sticky hands. Oh man, I, I can I've been there. I know all about that, but <laughs> it's just a bunch of overeager parents bringing their little ones in tow and trying to have them have an experience with Jesus. It, it wasn't like a nuclear bomb or anything. Like they they really did not have to protect Jesus in that way. And again, like you said, Jesus just totally flips their expectations on its head and says, "Look, I'm not too busy for them." You know, the interesting thing though too is that Jesus wasn't too busy for the disciples either because they were just a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and basically nobodies at one point. And so why all of a sudden do they act like they're more like Jesus bodyguards or bouncers (laughs) than the fishers of men that they're really called to be? As much guff as I give the disciples here, I think I can do this if I'm not careful. Forming cliques like the disciples had, it seemed like they were just kind of a tight-knit group and they were isolating or insulating themselves from others. And they were assigning certain people's worth as lower than theirs or not worth my time. And I guess I've been there. You know, it's human nature, but it's not Christ's nature. And our job is the people. That is exactly who we're there to serve is other people. And Jesus understood that these little children were his job. It it really makes you think about the Matthew 25 lesson Mm -hmm. of how we receive others is how Christ sees our reception of him. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's move on to our second segment here, and that is Deep Thoughts. And now Deep Thoughts. By Jack Handy. So we've got some deep thoughts about the early church. And one of the things that you see right off the bat from the early church in Acts 2, Acts chapter 4, is really how the church became available to each other, but also to the community around them. So what do you have here? What's your first deep thought? I was thinking about what kind of heart characterizes our relationship. So in Acts 2 verse 46 says, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Mm -hmm. Then in chapter 4 verse 32, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common. And so both of these passages emphasize that crazy shift in people's thinking about their possessions, which is something we usually just grasp and hold on to and mine. White knuckles. White knuckles, like the birds from that Pixar short or whatever it is. Mine, 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 (laughs) mine. (laughs) And they really opened things up in a kind of mind-blowing way. We sometimes say... Mikasa is Sukasa. <laughs> but here they kind of take that kind of hospitality and sharing to an extreme that is rarely seen. And it isn't from a mandate that the apostles give. It's not imposed on anyone. As Peter told Ananias and Sapphira, these possessions were theirs to do what they wanted to do with them. Acts 5 and verse 4. But the starting point for me, as I try to imitate this, is to have the kind of heart they had. That first verse I read emphasizes glad and generous hearts. Are my relationships and time with people characterized by gladness? It's just such a great word. It's so much better than happiness. Yeah. Gladness. Uh, There's like a seriousness underneath all of this mellow happiness that surrounds that word for me (laughs) as I think about it. But do I extend my time and my home and my food and my stuff with happy generosity, with gladness? And then that second verse from chapter 4, verse 32 says they were of one heart and soul. And we just talked about those two words, heart and soul. And this sharing of their stuff and their time together flowed from the shared excitement they had about the same thing. Mm -hmm. When you're excited about the same thing, it just bonds you. But the more important it is, the more profound the bond becomes. And when we look at other Christians, like we don't have much in common with them, we have reservations in the relationship. But when we see that we each are drinking deeply from the same source of life and joy, we can't wait to get back together at the end of a long, arduous workday even to talk and to listen and to learn and worship together. It just changes things when you see each other within that fellowship with God and that sharing of the most important things in your life. 
Yeah, I love that focus on heart. I mean, it really is the entire motivation of why almost immediately they go from giving their entire lives to the Lord to just magnetically attaching to each other the way that we see them doing there in the first few chapters. The only reason why that makes sense that they do it that way is because they have this gladness and they have a shared experience and there is passion and excitement. Yeah, and you have to have the heart before you give or it doesn't mean much, right? Exactly. And that leads into my deep thought, which is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the Macedonians. I mean, he's totally building them up. He's like, let me tell you about these guys. Let me tell you about what they're doing. In that verse, we just see how the Macedonian church, they had no reason to do all of the amazing, generous things that they did because on paper, they were going through a severe test of affliction and they were poor. They had really just a lot to deal with. But They gave and they gave and they gave more than they needed to give. And Paul is just almost boasting about them here. But what we see in their example is that dedication to the Lord is what led to their generosity. And so you talked about the heart leading to generosity. And here we see they first gave themselves to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They were so excited about giving. They were so excited about supporting the people who needed their money and their finances, these churches in Judea who really needed support. And they begged to be a part of this work. Like they couldn't have lived with themselves otherwise if they didn't get to support them. It was because they were so dedicated to the Lord wholeheartedly, like we've talked about before. They had their priorities in place and that led them to just liberally give and overflow their money in support of these people who needed them. And so I think availability is more than just throwing our leftover time and attention and even some of our finances someone's way. The best gift really comes from, like you were talking about, that sense of joy, that sense of heart and love and that passion that you have, but not for each other first. It comes in our commitment and our dedication to the Lord first. Full commitment to Jesus. And then, just like he loved us, we'd turn around and love others and we share with others and we are available to others, like Jesus talked about in John chapter 13. We love just as he loved us. And we do that because we're so dedicated to the Lord and that makes us magnetically connect to those disciples who need us. Yeah, it's like that story about the missionaries who... We're collecting funds from one village Mm -hmm. to take them to the next village so that they could bring the gospel to that next community. And everybody wanted to give something, give some food, give some money, give some kind of support. And they drew a big circle in the ground and they said, "Okay, just put whatever you want to give into the circle. And and then there was that young man who had nothing to give and tears well up in his eyes. And then he starts to have a smile wipe across his face as he walks up to the circle and steps into it and says, take me. (laughs) And so uh, one of those classic preacher stories that always kind of gets to me. I I really like that. But it's not just the way we give ourselves. It's also in what we seek from each other. Remember when Paul said something like, I do not seek yours, but you. And that's an important thing for us to keep expressing to each other. I don't need anything from you. I'm not looking to get something from you. I want you. I want your good. I want you to be whole and healthy in the Lord. I want to share my life with you in in that fellowship and partnership as much as you're willing to invite me to do so. Oh, for sure. All right. So what's the third deep thought? I think we've got four total. So here we go. Here we go. Are we available to pray together? In Acts 4, verses 23 and 24, Peter and John leave the Sanhedrin, it says when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. They're all praying together there about what has just happened. And then in chapter 12, verse 12, you see the same kind of thing happened. Peter was in prison and he's set free by a miraculous act of God. And it says, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, 
where many were gathered together and were praying. These are two stories where Peter leaves a dangerous situation, one with John and one alone. And where does he go? He went to his friends. I like that in chapter four, verse 23. He went to those who were his own and he finds a house full of believers. And there's this sharing of prayers. And if we want to have the togetherness and the success that that early church had, and we always go back, I always go back and say, look at this ideal that Luke is holding up. He's telling us this is what it looks like when the kingdom of God comes among you. You know, this is what does church looks like. And I want that. I want us to have that sharing I want us to have that evangelistic zeal. I want us to have all of those things. And if we want that, we need to have the fellowship of prayer that they had. This didn't come from them. It came as God's blessing upon them. That's very clear as you read through Acts. We need to meet, not just to share one prayer, but an evening of prayers. And I'm not saying that as a rule. I'm saying that's what they did. That is the blessing and the privilege we have to just keep coming to God, working through things, letting prayer be the center point for at least some of our gatherings as it was theirs. Maybe there's a prayer and then there's a discussion of concerns and then prayer about those concerns. There's time in the word and then prayer about the word from God and bringing it into our lives. And it changes relationships when you break through from formula prayers to praying for each other by name and by need, or even praying big dreams for what God can do among us. And so I think the more we can let prayer kind of settle in as the norm. What are we coming together to do? We're going to do a bunch of stuff. And of course, we're going to spend quite a bit of time in prayer. That's what we do. (laughs) This opportunity that we have to pray for each other and to be open and available to each other and not hide anything from each other and really just let the inner thoughts and our mindset and the concerns we have and everything just flow out. I feel like It's so easy to be guarded and it's so easy to put walls up and maybe pretend like things are better, but it's really hard to have an earnest and sincere prayer without being just totally open and honest and just laying it out there on the table. And what a great activity for the early church to do in connecting with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we do a lot of praying for each other. Hey, what Mm -hmm. can I pray for you? But what we see them doing quite a bit is praying with each other. Hey, what yeah. can I pray with you? Both are important, <laughs> yeah. but but let's maybe consider introducing a little more of that together time. Maybe when we get together for lunch, instead of just one prayer at the beginning, what if we had three prayers? Or what if we had just a little bit longer time where we each take turns? Just something to think about, a deep thought, if you will. Oh, I like so, it. <laughs> what's number four? So my last deep thought is... Kind of a different one. Later on in Acts, in Acts chapter 9, this is after Saul is converted. And it's kind of a whirlwind chapter where Saul sees the light and he realizes what needs to happen and he gives his life to the Lord. And then he comes to Jerusalem and he's trying to join the disciples. He's trying to connect himself with the believers down there in Jerusalem. And everybody is deathly afraid of him. And they didn't believe that he was a disciple. I mean, obviously. They knew Saul. They were well aware of who this guy was. And it seems like they were real skeptical of him. And I'm bringing this up because somebody steps in and bears Saul's burden. And of course, that's Barnabas. I mean, if anybody's going to do it, the son of encouragement is going to do it. And so Barnabas steps in and he takes Saul down to meet the apostles, have a conversation with them. And Barnabas totally stands up for Saul, says, look, Here's all the stuff that happened to him. Here's everything that's been going on. He's been preaching in the name of Jesus. And at that point, the disciples appear to accept Saul. And so the question I have is like, why did Barnabas stand up for Saul in this moment? And we're talking about availability here, but everybody's afraid of Saul. They're building up walls. They're trying to keep him out. And so that's what we can do sometimes. Build up walls, try to keep them at a distance. Be skeptical of them or afraid of them or concerned about letting them get too close to us. But Barnabas steps in and takes a real risk. He risks his reputation. He risks even his life from this former troublemaker. I mean, he had to have known something about Saul, you'd think. 
But on paper, it doesn't appear like Barnabas had any reason to stand up for Saul. And so maybe he's gullible. I mean, maybe he's just naive, but (laughs) I think Barnabas is somebody who is willing to shoulder Saul's burden and take a big risk for someone to see him treated fairly. And it just kind of makes me ask myself the question, like, do I build up walls and do I keep people at a distance or am I like a Barnabas who just doesn't mind my own business, gets involved in someone else's life and really risks it for them? putting myself out there and standing up to try and restore someone's reputation, try to build bridges instead of tearing them down, and being available to other people is risky and it's messy. There's a lot of question marks surrounding it. And I just wonder, could we learn something from Barnabas by standing up for others in this kind of courageous way? Oh, yeah. Barnabas changed Paul's life changed the course of the world absolutely by just believing in him Mm -hmm. by deciding i think this guy's for real i'm just gonna choose to believe that he didn't have to it's not like he knew that for a certainty he just said i'm gonna choose to believe that this is for real and he stood up for him and like you say he staked his reputation part of us is is my guy He's, (laughs) he's, he's the guy out of all the People in in the Bible besides Jesus that I always kind of hold up as, man, if I could be a Barnabas, that would that would be the thing to be. I, I would love to be someone who can stand for people like this to support others. He keeps standing for people that maybe there's reason to doubt. He calls on Paul again later, like a skilled evaluator of talent in chapter 11 later on when he's seeing the church at Antioch thrive and need a really good Bible teacher who knows the scriptures and can help these Greeks understand it. He goes and he finds Paul again and he brings him there and they work together and they encourage people and they teach people and what an important moment in Paul's life that is. And so he keeps doing this work bringing people along and putting them in the place where they can be effective and just putting a little faith in them, believing all things as love does, according to 1 Corinthians 13. All right, so let's get into our last segment here on the episode, and that is Through the Week. I am ready to face any challenges that might be foolish enough to face me. So every week we release five challenges that we're going to do, and we encourage you to do along with us. And here this week, we're doing five challenges on availability to others. The first challenge is a reading challenge, and we encourage you to read Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, which we talked about earlier, Luke 10, 29 to 37, Acts 4, 32 to 37, Philippians 2, 17 to 30, and Galatians 6, verses 1 to 10. And this last passage in Galatians 6, I mean, this is just an opus, really, to (laughs) availability and to sharing with people. I mean, it is chock full of ways to serve and be available. I mean, he talks about restoring a brother, bearing people's burdens with gentleness, sharing with others, not falling into the trap of good deed fatigue. Hmm. But then the reading ends here in verse 10 with this great summary of exactly what we're talking about. He says, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So look, I can't do it all and you can't do it all and we're not expected to do it all. But what do we have the opportunity to do? I mean, we've talked recently about what is the next step that we can take and That's the question we can ask ourselves in relationship to other people. What do I have the opportunity to do now? Who's the next person that I can influence or bless? And maybe they're not yet a believer, and that's no problem at all. Do good to them anyway. There is not a person that we will ever meet who Jesus didn't die for and who I don't have a responsibility to do good to and to show love to. And all of these passages here just are full of examples of love and service and blessing others and being available. And just reading through these, I think, is really encouraging. Yeah, that is a passage that will stretch us if we take it to heart. Oh, yeah. And speaking of stretching us, our reflect question asks us to ponder what opportunities to connect and serve lie just beyond my comfort zone? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> feels like the danger zone, but it's the comfort zone here. <laughs> <laughs> A little Kenny Loggins. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this year, I decided earlier this year 
I really spent some time thinking about this and journaling about it and, and really declared that I had to step out of some comfortable patterns that I just knew were hindering my service. And at first I thought it was going to be about inventing new projects or getting involved in new activities, but I've slowly realized that it is all in the honesty and commitment I bring to each interaction, to each person's difficulty and pain and the work of God's people that I see happening everywhere. I mean, it's not like you have to invent anything. Sometimes mm -hmm. new doors open, but if you just show up for the work, it takes you where you need to go. Show up and... Try not to over-idealize things or anything like that, but just keep doing this work. So as I said to myself, I had to move out of my old comfortable home and put it up for sale <laughs> and just <laughs> inhabit this pilgrimage. Like, you can't go back. That's gone. Can I search for it on Zillow? Yeah, yeah you can find it. It's, <laughs> it's there, but it's small. It's a very small house. You need, sure. I, I needed to step out of it. And this is an ongoing challenge. I have to be willing to do that most dangerous thing that we just talked about Barnabas doing, to believe, to yeah. believe in the massive difference that I can make, even though who am I, you know? But God can do amazing things, and I have to keep believing that. I have to believe in the goodness of people who keep hurting me. I have to, most importantly, keep believing in the God who can work in even somebody like me. Our comfort zones are so comfortable, <laughs> but they're so dangerous. <laughs> I mean, nothing good comes from just being comfortable, which actually leads into our third challenge here, which is a request challenge, and that's to pray to the Lord, Lord, here I am, send me. And that is from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. This is exactly what we're talking about here, just stepping out of my comfort zone, being available to God, and being available to go out into the world that God sends me into and just letting him take care of the results of that and being unafraid to step out there and do things that are uncomfortable. This is kind of a version of the prayer that I pray regularly, which is to show me the open doors around me. We don't need to create new opportunities. Just open your eyes and see the ones that already exist around you. Isaiah here in this example is available to God. Unlike a certain fishy prophet that we talked about recently, <laughs> he is not running the opposite direction from God. He is running to God. It's almost like, oh, oh, you need somebody to do this job? Here, here I am. <laughs> Send me. I'm ready to go. Put me in, coach. And <laughs> he's ready to go for the Lord. It would have been much more comfortable for Isaiah to run and hide from God, especially when you get to like Isaiah chapter 20, where he's called for three years to prophesy naked and barefoot, which is <laughs> yeah. one of my favorite chapters in Isaiah. That would be one of your favorite chapters in Isaiah. <laughs> it absolutely is. But when we're dedicated to God, what else are we going to do? Where are we going to go but where God sends us? And what work does he have for us that he wants us to do right now, today? And so pray to him, Lord, here I am. Send me. Like all of these prayers, they all should have this warning, like, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> exactly, because you might get it. It's, it's crazy how it works. Well, you said, what are you willing to do? What does God have for you today? Well, here's one thing. The respond challenge for this week, a, a challenge of an action that you can take right now, is to check in with three people listening for ways to bless them through quality time, prayer, and service. That's good. Yeah. Super specific. It is. Yeah. And I think underlying this is the idea that how we connect with people is as important as that we connect with people. We need to connect with people, but there's different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't need a senior advisor looking over their shoulder. <laughs> just like, up, 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 wait. They need a friend. Friends tell the truth when there's a readiness for it. Friends see the good to admire and honor and appreciate in each other. Friends love at all times, ready to jump into action. And there are different kinds of friendships. You don't have to pin it down to one ideal. You, you have different kinds of people in your life, and those relationships are going to be different. But there are certain things that characterize a friendship. And most of the time, I find that the most fruitful way I can start contributing to someone 
whether it's someone I want to share the gospel with or a young brother I want to encourage or whatever relationship it is, friendship is the context and really the best way to start making a difference and allowing them, helping them to draw nearer to God. And as we see Jesus in his conversation with the woman at the well from Samaria, I mean, he's listening to her. He's dialoguing with her. He's not discounting her. The times when he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. I mean, he's just eating with them. He's being there. He's being available to them. He's making himself a friend to them. And I think that's exactly what we can do for each other. And you're never going to know how to serve each other until you spend the time, listen to each other, and find out a way that really counts in their life to bless them and serve them. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I love that you brought it back to the accusation that people had against Jesus, that he was, as they all said, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yep. And Jesus like, look, that's what you're saying. That's what you see in me. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. In mm-hmm. other words, I'm doing the wise thing by being a friend to these people. And it's going to be seen by my actions and their fruit. What is real wisdom? Being a friend to people who need a friend, who you would never maybe think of as someone that the Lord would introduce himself to and try to build a real relationship with. Well, speaking of relationships, the last challenge that we have is a reach out challenge, and that's to go to somebody and ask them a spiritual question. And it is this this week. How have your relationships evolved when you've gotten more involved? How did we end up with a rhyming challenge? This is great. It just Uh, flows right off the tongue. I love it. So Ryan, how have your relationships evolved (laughs) When you've gotten more involved. I feel like we want to say it one more time, but uh, we'll we'll just keep going. Yeah, I think that I learned to receive as well as I get. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family that didn't like to take anything from anyone, (laughs) even each other in the family. And I don't mean like I'm not going to take any lip. I mean, like good things. You don't give me money. You don't get me a cup of water. I get you a cup of water. We serve. We're not served seem to be the tone and the, the commitment that we had underlying all this comes from a good place. No, you go first. No, you. No, you go first. <laughs> but I've really learned, and I guess it seems obvious, that this hinders my relationships. And I need to gratefully receive any gift, any invitation any words of appreciation that someone offers. I need to be all the more ready to give it as well, but also to give people as much opportunity to let that go both ways. And at its root, it goes back to the heart. It goes back to seeing each other with dignity and respect, knowing we all have something to give in the church and we all have something to receive. Yeah, that is a great reminder because my family was the same exact way. I remember (laughs) my mom, when I was growing up, she had broken her arm. And there's a whole story behind that we could get into. And it was all my fault, actually. But my mom (laughs) broke her arm and she was unable to do a lot of the things around the house that she normally was doing. And people all the time were trying to come over and like clean the house for her, take care of cooking or do this or do that. And just one right after another, my mom would shut people down like nobody's business. It was like, nope, you're not going to help. Nope, you're not going to help. And finally, at some point, she realized like, no, I just have to let people help me. And that was a really hard realization for her. And I'm the same exact way. It just doesn't work when we're shutting people down and not giving them the opportunity to serve us, just like we're trying to do for them. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of these points that we're making throughout this whole episode has to do with putting ourselves at the same level with each other, shoulder to shoulder, in it together, partnering, giving and receiving, and in that place of koinonia, of fellowship and friendship. So I will ask you, because we need it one more time, how have your relationships evolved when you've gotten more involved? (laughs) I was thinking about this, and one of the things I came up with is this phrase, the more I know, the more I let go. Mm. And there's a tendency in me, if I'm not careful to make assumptions about people or to jump to conclusions about maybe their motives or why they're doing something, and it's obviously not something that I'm super proud of, But it's just something that I need to work on. But I found that the more I get to know somebody and connect with them, help them out or learn about them, learn about their life, the more 
I find that I just turn the volume down on all these little difficulties that we might have, all these assumptions that I might make, or all these conclusions I might jump to. And the more I know, the more I just let it go. It turns somebody from a stranger who I'm skeptical of into a friend who I'm able to trust and share with. Just getting to know somebody and finding out more about them and they become a person instead of just somebody out there that I don't know very well. Yeah, it's interesting how much of this episode has come down to giving people a chance and believing in them. And it's not just that the relationships become better whenever we have that kind of attitude towards people. Like you're saying, starting with that trust and grace and a willingness to not write people off. Mm -hmm. It also helps us have a healthy soul. Skepticism and fear and paranoia (laughs) or that kind of thing really just shrinks you and makes you small, puts you into some dark places. Sometimes it's as simple as just making contact, just being people together and just talking a little bit. And that opens up a different perspective of who people are. And so as we wrap this conversation up, let's talk about what we're going to cover on the next episode. We've been talking about dedication, giving ourselves wholly, counting the cost, establishing our priorities, and here being available to people. So next episode, we're going to get into servanthood. We're going to talk about seeing our role as a servant with new eyes. So it's almost like a paradox, and we'll get into that all on the next episode. It's going to be a good conversation. Yeah, the upside-down kingdom of Jesus that he introduces. You have to let go of your old assumptions and start to let the truth show you a new way to see. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Bible Geeks podcast. You can find us on our website at BibleGeeks.fm. You can find show notes for this episode in your podcast player of choice or at BibleGeeks.fm slash 102. You can also follow along with this cross-training series. That's at BibleGeeks.fm slash cross-training. If you want to get in touch with us, reach out, ask us a question. You can do that on our website, or you can drop into our Facebook group. We're all there just talking about these episodes one by one. We'd love to talk to you about things that you're thinking and things you'd like to hear on upcoming episodes. And until next week, everyone, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom. Shalom.